Hi, I'm Dr. Stephanie Fabian. I am with the Women's Health Clinic and I'm Director of the Office of Women's Health and it's my pleasure to talk with you today about our upcoming article in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings entitled Genitourinary Syndrome of Menopause, Management Strategies for the Clinician. Genitourinary Syndrome of Menopause, or GSM, previously known as atrophic vaginitis or vulvovaginal atrophy, affects more than half of postmenopausal women. The change in terminology was proposed and endorsed by multiple medical societies to one, acknowledge the involvement of not only the vulvar and vaginal tissues, but also the lower urinary tract. Two, to call attention to the fact that this is a result of the loss of estrogen around the time of menopause. And three, to avoid the negative connotations associated with the term atrophy. Symptoms of GSM include vaginal dryness, itching, dyspareunia, urinary frequency and urgency, and increased urinary tract infections. Unlike vasomotor symptoms, which typically get better over time after menopause, GSM is chronic and progressive, and symptoms are unlikely to resolve without treatment. GSM adversely affects a woman's quality of life and interferes with partner relationships. Despite this, women are often embarrassed to bring up the problem with their healthcare providers, and the providers do not always actively screen for GSM. In a recent survey called the Empower Survey, most women were willing to try a product for symptom relief and would welcome information and treatment suggestions from their healthcare provider. Still, GSM remains underdiagnosed and undertreated as only about 7% of affected women receive prescription therapy. GSM is a clinical diagnosis and laboratory testing is usually unnecessary. On examination, changes include thinning and resorption of the labia minora, loss of the labial fat pad, scant pubic hair, and narrowing of the introitus. A pelvic examination is helpful to exclude other vulvar and vaginal conditions that may present with similar symptoms. It's important to know that several effective treatments exist, but low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy is the standard of care. It is effective and safe for most women. Vaginal estrogen products include vaginal creams, tablets, and a ring. A vaginal soft gel capsule is an emerging treatment option for treatment of GSM that is not yet FDA approved. Women may notice improvement in their symptoms within a few weeks of initiating treatment, but it may take a full 8 to 12 weeks for the effect. Observational data show no harm with extended use of vaginal estrogen therapy, but clinical trial safety data are limited to one year. A progestogen is typically not required for endometrial protection in women receiving low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy. Newer treatment options include intravaginal DHEA and selective estrogen receptor modulators as well as laser therapy. Intravaginal DHEA comes as a 6.5 milligram vaginal suppository that is inserted nightly, and the selective estrogen receptor modulator ospemaphine is administered as a 60 milligram dose given orally once a day. For some women with milder symptoms, over-the-counter products such as vaginal moisturizers used on a regular basis every one to three days is helpful for maintaining vaginal moisture. Vaginal lubricants are used as needed for sexual activity. Sometimes, when symptoms have been present for quite a long time, the pelvic floor muscles tighten and pelvic floor physical therapy is needed in addition to treatment of the vaginal tissues. Sex therapy may be helpful for women with sexual dysfunction. Breast cancer survivors represent a unique group of women who may have persistent and severe symptoms related to GSM. In general, Non-hormonal treatments are preferred as initial strategies, but after careful discussion of potential risks and benefits, low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy may be considered in women with refractory symptoms affecting their quality of life. It is important that in women with a history of breast cancer, if one is considering using low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy to involve the woman's oncologist in decision-making. 
The goal of aromatase inhibitor therapy in the setting of breast cancer is to reduce circulating estradiol levels, so low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy should be used cautiously in women receiving AI therapy for breast cancer treatment. Small but significant increases in estradiol levels have been noted in women treated with aromatase inhibitors while using the 25 microgram estradiol tablet, which is no longer available, or the estradiol ring. Intravaginal DHEA administered nightly is thought to exert its effect by local conversion to testosterone and estradiol. It has not been shown to increase systemic steroid hormone levels beyond the postmenopausal range, presumably because of local inactivation. Therefore, it may be a safer alternative to vaginal estrogen in women with hormone-sensitive cancers. Ozpemaphine, as mentioned, is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, or SERM, approved for treatment of moderate to severe dyspareunia caused by GSM in menopausal women. And although it does not appear to stimulate breast tissue, its safety in women with or at high risk for breast cancer has yet to be established. Laser therapy for GSM has been tested in smaller, uncontrolled clinical trials with positive results. The carbon dioxide laser has been cleared by the FDA, but is not specifically indicated for treatment of GSM. So in conclusion, there are many treatment options available for management of GSM. It's a very common and undertreated problem, and providers may need to ask women about their symptoms as they are unlikely to volunteer symptoms without being asked. Thank you for your attention today. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.